Welcome to the Fence Design course. This course is geared toward New York State Soil and Water Conservation District design technicians, specifically those with very little or no experience in agricultural fencing. If you've been doing fencing a long time and you've installed them, had them built by contractors, have read the specs, have even written your own specs, uh, feel free to just skim through the lectures. Most of this will be review. Get to the class examples, do those and just do the project and send it in for me. This course does count for conservation approval authority for the fence design standard uh, for New York State technicians. Now, as you may know, there's already a lot of information on the web about fences, design, installation, estimating, uh, electrifying. So feel free to head up YouTube and watch a ton of videos on fences. Uh, any topic that I'm covering here has already been covered a lot uh, by other people on the web, so feel free to make use of those resources. Here we have an H brace. This is by far the most common end brace used for high tensile fencing in New York. Let's look at how it's put together. First up, you have a corner post. NRCS updated their fence specifications in 2021 to match current fence construction techniques and materials available in the Northeast United States. For corner and brace posts, they need to be seven and a half feet long and a minimum of five inches in diameter. Here's an example product page from Williams Fences website. The posts are eight feet long and tapered from five to six inches. You pound them in with the smaller end pointed down. They're made from treated Southern yellow pine and it says right on the listing that for brace posts, corner posts, or bigger line posts. Next up we have the brace post. This should be the same size as the corner post. Then we have the cross member. This is normally eight feet long but can go up to 10 feet. The diameter needs to be four inches minimum, and you'll see here in the spec that there's a requirement that diagonal braces be 10 feet long. That's referring to a floating brace, which is sometimes just called a diagonal brace. A floating brace uses a diagonal rail that pushes down onto a concrete or stone footing, and it's held in place by a brace wire close to the ground. Building a floating brace requires a few extra steps, and an H brace is almost always preferred if you have a post pounder. They are allowed in the fence spec though, and some producers prefer them. Here's another product page from William, Williams Fence showing brace rails. They're pretty similar to the corner posts, but just sized four to five inches instead. Same material, treated southern yellow pine. And an important thing to note is that the cross member needs to be pinned into the brace post and corner post. Uh, you'll see some details for notching them in. Uh, that's really not as secure, you need to use 3 8 inch galvanized brace pins. They make them just for this purpose. They're not that expensive. It's easy to drill in the field with a cordless drill. So make sure that your installer uses brace pins. And last up, we need a wire. This is the brace wire. Normally, it's a double figure eight of high tensile wire, uh, tightened with a ratcheting strainer, or even with a gripple, sometimes if they're trying to save money. Another option is to do a quick brace. That's like an eighth inch cable that loops around the bottom, comes up, loops back on itself, and it's also tightened with a gripple. And then the last option is a double loop uh, with no figure eight. Uh, they make a double loop with high tensile wire, put a stick in it, which is called a twitch stick. They loop the stick around and around and around and that twists the wire uh, together, tightening it then the stick is uh, wired to the top post, uh, the cross member, to keep it in place permanently. Now let's just look at uh, how this is for how the forces are loaded onto this structure. It, it can fail, and we want to prevent it from failing. Basically for a four wire fence, you'll have 250 pound loads all up the corner post. That's where the, the wires are attached. That racks the whole thing to the side, but that action is resisted by tension in the brace wire. Now if we break down the brace wire tension, it actually has a vertical and horizontal component. And the vertical component is really something we want to minimize. The vertical component of this tensile force is actually pulling the corner post up out of the ground. And that's the primary way that these braces fail is that the corner post pulls up and the whole thing gets out of alignment and, and tilts over a little bit. Um, so if you extend this brace cross member out, if you made it say 16 feet instead, then this tensile force would lay 
further down towards the ground, and then the vertical component would be much less. I know the NRCS spec specifically says eight foot to 10 foot cross members, but again, that's a suggestion. You can change that if you wanna allow 16 foot braces in your projects, uh, feel free to go ahead and do that. All right, next up, we're gonna talk about fence posts. For the vast majority of fence installations in New York State, we're going to be using pressure treated southern yellow pine posts. And these are pressure treated with CCA, that's chromated copper arsenic. Uh, that's the old style pressure treatment that's been phased out of residential lumber. So it's really only found in an agricultural fence posts now. It lasts a really long time. It's probably a carcinogen. So just be careful if you generated a dust, you definitely don't want to breathe it. They come in bundles like this and they have that distinctive grayish green color that indicates the pressure treatment. Um, if you're on an organic operation, you can't use CCA or really any pressure treatment compounds. Uh, so in that case, commercially available cedar posts uh, are the way to go. Unless the farmer has a stand of black locust, they can cut that up and split them for fence posts. So that's, a, that's actually a much better option if you can use black locust because uh, it lasts a very long time. In some installations, you'll need a square post, like attaching against the back of a wall or something. It might be easier. Uh, so uh, posts rated for ground contact are available from lumber yards. They're not treated with CCA, so they probably won't last as long, but they're still okay to use. Uh, what's not okay to use is landscaping lumber. These are not rated for ground contact and they'll rot away in only a couple of years. So absolutely do not use landscaping lumber. Make sure it's treated for ground contact. Now for line posts, you have some other options, metal, fiberglass, and plastic. Um, remember for your corner and end and gate posts, you wanna use a big solid wood post uh, for the extra strength it provides. But the line posts are really just keeping the wires elevated off the ground. Uh, for metal posts, there's two sections available, T posts and U posts. T-posts are used almost exclusively for agricultural fencing. They just drive better and they don't bend as easily. Uh, they're definitely the way to go. To connect the wires, they're just plastic clip-on uh, insulators. Here's the style with the removable post. Here's another one, just a simple clip. Uh, next up, we have fiberglass. Fiberglass comes with pre-drilled holes. Uh, or just solid rods. Uh, the pre-drilled holes are for using cotter pins. The solid rods are for little spring type clips. Um, I'll show you what those look like. Here's the installation. You know, they're just driven into the ground. The wires are strung. On the left, there's a spring clip. Squeeze it together, slide it on, and clip the wire into it. For the cotter pins, uh, it's pre-drilled so you fasten that onto the wire and then bend the free ends around the pipe, uh, around the post. Fiberglass is self-insulating, so you don't need a plastic insulator uh, connecting to the post. Plastic is the next option. It's not really plastic. It's a plastic wood composite. It's wood and plastic and glue, cemented, glued together under heat and pressure. Uh, basically like your plastic uh, composite decking that's been popularized in the last few years. Uh, for these, you field drill them. So you drill each hole in the field and then attach the wires with cotter pins. And in this case, he's gonna bend these leads uh, back around the post to secure them. Uh, these are not actually fed posts. These are called battens. Uh, I have never seen battens installed on a project in New York. That doesn't mean they're not out there. Uh, using battens lets you put in less fence posts and they're really intended for very long, straight, flat installations. And in New York, typically we're grazing the hills, not the long, flat ground. Uh, we're putting corn on that. So uh, battens are definitely an option. They're mentioned in the spec, so I want to mention them here. They just keep the wires from being forced apart. Uh, when an animal presses on these, uh, it can get through if it can push the wires far apart, uh, far apart enough. And not so much an issue on electric fences, but on uh, non-electric. Uh, that could help you with your post spacing and get further apart. Last up, I want to mention trees. Trees are a viable option for fence posts. They are usually not located in an ideal location though. Uh, you shouldn't attach anything directly to the tree. Definitely use a pressure treated board between 
the wires in the tree that'll keep the, the wires from girdling into the tree. Uh, here's an example of a line post with just a board uh, with some deck screws or nails into it. All the required sizes, lengths, and weights for line posts are listed in the fence specs. They need to be five and a half feet long, and there are different material requirements for each type of line post. Also, the spec doesn't allow trees for corner or end posts anymore. Sometimes when you're driving fence posts, you'll encounter a spot where the post drives in really, really easily. And this means that the soil is really weak. Okay, this usually happens at low points where the water uh, table saturates the soil and it's just wetter uh, than normal and that makes the soil weaker. So what are you gonna do to avoid this? Remember, the posts do more than just keep the wires off the ground. They also keep the wires down to the ground. So if you're going down through a low spot and the post can be pulled out of the ground easily, the wire tension themselves will just pull the post up over time and, and fail the fence. So here's one spot that's actually not a low spot. Uh, it's an end post and the soil was too weak. So they put in a T-post uh, into the bank adjacent and then attached a wire guide wire uh, to the post and then tighten it with a ratcheting strainer. Okay, so this tension in this wire is gonna resist the pull of the fence against this post uh, and hopefully hold it in place better. Another thing they did here was to put an extra long brace rail. I believe it was 12 feet or 16 feet. See, if you have a very long brace rail, that lowers the angle of the brace wire uh, and makes it more of a horizontal pull uh, rather than a vertical pull pulling the post up. See, the lower the angle of your brace wire, that means the less the vertical component of that tension will be. Uh, another thing you can do instead of uh, doing a guy wire out to a T-post is use a, a duckbill anchor. And these can hold a lot more than a T-post will. It's basically a, a little toggle that's driven into the ground. And then you, uh, it has a, a, a wire rope attached to it. You pull on the wire rope and that rotates the anchor. And once it's perpendicular to your hole, then it's locked. Uh, now in strong soils, these can hold a lot, like up to 3,000 pounds, but uh, we're proposing to use them in weak soils. So that capacity is gonna be severely limited. Uh, still, they would hold more than a T-post driven in. Uh, and these need to be done with wire rope, uh, preferably stainless, uh, rather than um, high tensile wire. Another thing you can do is put concrete around the post. Okay, you don't wanna be hauling enough concrete to do every post in a line. That's gonna really set you back. But if you have a weak spot, you can dig a collar area around the post and you could pour in uh, pre-mixed concrete or some people just put in dry mix. If it's a wet area, uh, the water in the soil will hydrate the cement in the concrete over time. Um, the important thing to remember is that you need to make it a collar, not a cup. You can't cup the base of the post or that'll collect water and rot the post really fast. Okay, the next couple things are from the old NRCS Pasture and Range handbook. So they're a little silly looking at first, but uh, they can give you some good ideas. This is for a barbed wire fence across a gully, and they are just holding the wires down with uh, concrete dead man anchors. Okay, and that's just gonna keep the tension on the wire uh, kind of absorbed into those anchors to keep the wires from pulling this post up out of the ground. Now, if this was an electric fence, I would just go straight across this and do droppers to cover the opening. Okay, but since it's barbed wire, it's uh, that it's a possibility uh, to do. And lastly, this is another one from NRCS Pasture and Range from the old days. Uh, you could tie a giant stone to your post and bury the whole thing. I don't recommend doing this, of course, unless you have maybe six guys that you pay 15 cents a day and they can go find big stones and dig book holes. But uh, the other ones, uh, definitely uh, try those out uh, next time you have a fence post with a weak soil. The spec has a good narrative about installing posts. There's a table for post spacing based on the number of wires and whether you use, you're using battens. The next page gets into how deep to drive the posts and how to handle hand dug and augered holes. In section four of the spec, there are instructions on where to put the braces and how to construct them. One question that comes up often 
is whether you need a brace to support the weight of a swinging tubular gate. The answer is no. You may hang a tubular gate on a single corner post and it will support the weight. Gates are mentioned here as locations for braces because often you'll terminate a long line of fence at a gate. Other times, there'll be a gate right next to the st structure or at the corner of a paddock and you won't need a brace on one side of the opening. Next, we'll take a closer look at the hardware it takes to put a fence together. First up, we've got brace pins. These are 3 8 inch diameter, class 3 galvanized steel pins, and they're used for assembling the H braces. Here you have the brace post end of the brace with a little nub of the pin sticking out, and that provides a nice resting place for the brace wire to sit on. Of course, at the corner post, you don't want stuff like this sticking out because it could get caught on uh, clothes or animals. Next up, we've got staples. Staples also need to be class three galvanized and they should have barbs, uh, which helps keep them pulling out, especially out of softwoods. Uh, in this picture, here's a pretty rusty one that's probably not class three galvanized. It was probably just a cheapo uh, hardware store staple that was class one galvanized and rusted after a few years. So they should be class three. It's not that much more expensive and lasts a lot longer. Next up, we've got the inline ratcheting strainers. Okay, these have a detachable handle that fits onto this wheel and the handle uh, is pushed around the, the axle to tighten this uh, wire loop. You can see it's just a, a loop of wire on one side and then coiled around this, this ratcheting uh, bar on this side. Okay, and these are used for tightening brace wires and for tightening the line wires themselves. So on a, a standard like four wire fence, you would have four of these, uh, one for each wire uh, to tighten it. Next up, we've got the Gripple. This is a proprietary joining device, but you see them all over the place. They're really easy to use. Uh, you stick wire in from one side and then the other, and then there's a special ratcheting uh, tool that tightens them. And the, uh, the Gripple itself has little rollers inside that prevent the wires from getting pulled out. Kind of like a Chinese finger puzzle. Okay, the wires can go in, but they can't go back out. Next up, the tension indicator springs. Uh, in this case, this is kind of over-designed. Most installers will just use one tension indicator spring per set of wires, and then they'll adjust the tension on the other wires by feel. Okay, once this tension indicator spring is bottomed out, that means that wire is at 250 pounds tension. Okay, so you don't necessarily need a indicator spring for every wire. You can do it by feel if you have one set to the proper tension. There's also tools for measuring tension, so you could get by without having any springs if you wanted to use the tools instead. Um, but remember that this indicator spring does not add any bounce to the wires. Uh, it's not like a springy shock absorber type thing. Once it's fully indicated 250 pounds, it's fully bottomed out. It doesn't bounce anymore. Uh, so just remember that. Next up, we'll talk a little bit about insulators. Uh, this is just a basic insole tube. It's like a plastic straw, uh, obviously rated for many thousand volts of, of insulation. And uh, you want to remember that insole tubes can only be used on straight runs. See, the, the wire's coming through straight. If it's wrapping around the post, you need something else. Uh, if this wraps around a post or a tree or something, the wire will cut right through it uh, due to the fence tension. If you are wrapping around a post, you'll need a wraparound insulator. You can see in this picture, there's a little strip of metal inside the insulator. And that strip of metal keeps the wire from cutting through the insulator and touching the post. Okay, so when these are installed, that strip of metal must be on the inside of the wire. Okay, it must be there to protect uh, the insulator from getting cut. And finally, we have pin type insulators. These are uh, removable pins that you can pull out so you can detach the wire. In this case, it's, it's a stream crossing and uh, the operator has pulled out the pins on the lower insulators and then lifted the wires up over the post. And that'll allow more debris to flow through uh, during spring, spring rains. The fence spec covers a bit about fence hardware in section five. There are instructions on which side to place the wires, where to use insulators, and how to terminate ends. Is info on driving staples, wire wraps, and inline strainers. This is a good time to jump over to the standard drawings in the fence IR. 
IR just stands for implementation requirements. It's basically just a worksheet that you fill in with your design information to help the contractor actually build the fence. We'll cover the fence IR in detail a bit later. The idea here with the drawing sheets is that you fill out sheets you need and discard the ones you don't. There are fields you can fill in on each sheet for things like wire heights, and at the end are standard details for braces, stapling, and wire splicing. All brace wires are shown with twitch sticks, but any brace wire type is acceptable. Next, we're gonna look at electric fencing systems. Here's a basic diagram of an electric fence setup. You'll see this in the literature and in some manufacturer's brochures too. There's a charger, the fence, a lightning diverter with a separate ground system, and then the charger ground system. Now most producers in New York don't go ahead and install this lightning diverter and separate ground rod system. Okay, and I recommend if you're working with producers that you don't advise them to do this either. It, if they have a lot of lightning damage, they can always install that in the future, but it's kind of a lot of work and it's probably not really needed. Okay, so most producers are gonna omit this part and just have a charger directly connected to their fence wires with no diverter in between. So what's actually happening in this? When an animal touches the wires, uh, current flows from the charger through a cutoff switch to the hot wires through the animal's body and then down into moist ground. Okay, the ground has to be moist. Then the current flows through the ground back to the charger ground rods and up back to the charger, completing a circuit. Okay, and it's not a continuous flow, it's a pulse. Like once a second, a pulse of current comes out, goes through the circuit, comes back. All right, if it was a continuous current, if someone grabbed the wire, uh, the current would force them to seize it and you wouldn't be able to let go and be a real big mess. So it's just a little pulse uh, once a second. Now the chargers are all fairly similar in components. It's a plastic box with a bunch of stuff inside. Now Taylor Fence, they make these Cyclops chargers. Uh, they have a breakdown on their website and I'm just going to go through that quickly to show you the internal components. So here's a Taylor Fence AC Master Fence Charger. Uh, open box. Uh, AC just means that it plugs into a wall outlet and uses AC current from the electrical grid. Basically, when the charger is shocking someone, uh, that means current is flowing out through the wires, back through the ground rods. It's basically coming in from the lines, goes through some uh, surge protection to a control board. The control board sends the power to a bank of capacitors capacitors store energy this is happening once every second remember so during most of the second these charge these capacitors charge up and then when the pulse is ready to go out they dump it into an output transformer which steps up the voltage incredibly in this case it goes from about 600 volts up to 8,000 volts that dumps it through some more lightning protection and then out to the fence wires okay when it's not actively shocking something uh, the operation is a little bit different, but needless to say, it does not use much electricity when it's not shocking something. So these can run year round, uh, as long as they're not continuously outputting shocks, uh, they'll use very little electricity. The output of a fence charger is rated in joules, and each manufacturer will have a separate chart for how many miles of fence wire that each charger can uh, charge. So just use the manufacturer's literature as a guide uh, to pick a charger. As usual, bigger is better and typically more expensive is better quality, unfortunately. All right, next up, I wanna talk about ground rods. These should be half inch minimum, six feet long, galvanized, and typically have three feet of moist soil contact per joule of output power. Okay, that's kind of a conservative rating, but it's found in many spots in the literature. They should be spaced about 10 feet apart. They should be wired together and to the ground terminal uh, on the charger. And finally, they should be about 50 to 75 feet away from the main electrical system ground rod. When power comes in from the power grid, it'll come to a distribution panel and that, that distribution panel will be connected to a single ground ground rod for 
uh, whatever the farm's power system is. Okay, and you want to make sure that this is separate from that, at least 50 feet away. Otherwise, you'll have uh, you could have stray voltage problems uh, coming up. You could have current coming up from the ground to the ground rod for the main power system. A regular electric fence system relies on soil moisture for the current to flow back to the energizer ground system. There are places where the soil is not suitable either all or part of the year. For example, sandy, volcanic, bedrock, or frozen conditions can all have poor soil conductivity. One way to address this is by using an earth wire return system. In this setup, an animal must touch both a hot wire and a ground wire to receive a shock, but there is no requirement for soil moisture. A double throw switch is a nice accessory to an earth wire return system. It allows the earth wires to be either hot or grounded and allows the farmer to select based on seasonal rainfall and soil conditions. The center pole goes out to the fence and the outer poles go either to the charger or the ground bed. Some summers we have virtually no drought and the wires can be hot all season. Other years there's an extended drought and the earth return wires can be grounded to keep the fence effective. I want to briefly mention batteries and solar powered units. Uh, as I mentioned before, when the system is not shocking something, it uses very little power. And that means the batteries can be very effective at running these things, especially far out in your fields, away from uh, the power grid. So in general, if you're going to do batteries, you should do solar because it's just more self-contained. You don't have to keep charging the battery. And uh, there's charged out there for how many, watt it, how many watts per joule, uh, per amp hour. So just um, look for those and it, you know, totally doable. They come as kits or you can uh, you know, use your own solar panel uh, with, with battery power chargers. And finally, since this is just a very brief introduction, I encourage you to go out and look at other references. Here's the one from NRCS in Missouri. Here's one from Extension. Uh, in Wisconsin, and this one's from a manufacturer, Stafex. Uh, they're all great resources. Uh, definitely check all those out in your free time. Barbed wire has definitely decreased in popularity in recent decades, especially due to the prevalence of low-cost chargers and advances in high tensile fencing. But it's still used for repairs or splicing into existing installations and also for Amish or Mennonite producers, they'll use barbed wire exclusively. Uh, electri electrification is not an option for them. A few slides to show, but before I do that, I just want to show you this uh, YouTube channel by Red Brand. Uh, their username is RWL2009. They have a ton of videos, not just for barbed wire, but also for woven wire and high tensile and installing posts, all kinds of good stuff. So definitely check out their channel and browse through their videos. They have one exclusively for barbed wire installation. That's definitely uh, worth watching to understand how it's tensioned and attached to the posts. There's a common problem of over-tensioning barbed wire, um, and they'll show you, uh, you know, what the sag is supposed to look like uh, when it's properly tensioned. Jumping over to the barbed wire spec, notice this is spec 382A now. We've been focused on 382B so far, and now it's time to look at some of the specific requirements for barbed wire. First thing to note is that barbed wire comes in two different material types. There's conventional and high tensile. Conventional has pretty much been replaced by high tensile wire. High tensile is lighter, stronger, and most importantly, cheaper. At the time of production, a quarter mile of conventional barbed wire at tractor supply was $130, while 15 and a half gauge high tensile was only $70. In addition, there are more options for high tensile and more comp competition in the market. The only downside is that high tensile is stiffer and harder to make knots with. Another change from the old spec is that you can use two point or four point barbs on high tensile wire now. Both products are found on the market and this pretty much comes down to producer's preference. There's a warning against electrifying a barbed wire fence. It's much easier for an animal to become tangled in this type of fencing because of the barbs and a tangled electrified fence is deadly. Woven wire is also widely used in New York State. And just like barbed wire, I'll direct you to the Red Brand YouTube channel. There are a lot of good installation videos showing how to install their products and similar ones from other brands. Here's their video for V-Mesh horse fence installation. V-Mesh is a type of woven wire. Um, one thing to note about 
uh, the Red Brand videos is that they use a dummy brace for stretching their fence. Uh, that's a little cumbersome. Most contractors in New York are going to use a truck or a tractor uh, to, to tension their fence, and that's perfectly acceptable too. There's just a few things I want to say about woven wire. Um, the spec, uh, the 382 spec, has uh, minimum gauges for conventional high tensile. Uh, for the top and bottom wires, it's you know 10 and a half, 10 and a half. The top and bottom wire just means the top horizontal wire and the bottom horizontal wire. The remaining wires, uh, that's what this means, the remaining horizontal wires. And then the stay wires are the vertical wires that go up and down. And remember, for woven wire, it's the same with barbed. You never want to electrify it because an animal can get tangled in it. And that is uh, that's a really dangerous situation. Um, you're looking for woven wire, not welded wire. Okay, welded wire is sold usually in lighter gauges. It just means the wires up and down and horizontal have been spot welded uh, right at the intersections. Sometimes you see this label as, as rabbit fence. Um, you can use it for, you know, your gardens, trying to keep out woodchucks and rabbits. But it's not very good for containing cattle because uh, it's very stiff and brittle. If an animal pushes up against it, these joints tend to break and they end up with sharp shards that, that poke out. See, if this breaks, then this little section of wire here will poke out and uh, can be very sharp. With woven wire, the vertical wires are tied onto the horizontal wires with wire knots. So they do slide a little bit. So when an animal presses up against it, the mesh deforms a little bit, but then comes back into shape. So there's basically two types. There's the, the rectangular openings and the V-mesh. Uh, so V-mesh is popular for horse owners. Uh, a lot of people like it. Um, the rectangular openings can either be standard, uh, which are typically 6 to 12 inches between the verticals, or no climb, uh, which is, is 2 inches between the verticals. No climb pretty much just means horses and people cannot climb it because the verticals are too close together. You can't get a foot or a hoof into it. Um, at the fence posts, uh, in order to tie this off, they strip back the verticals uh, for 12 to 18 inches and then wrap them around the post uh, to each other. So basically picture you know, woven wire with, with the verticals all chopped out and then the horizontal wires can wrap around the post uh, back onto itself. Woven wire is typically um, installed with a single barbed or hot wire on top. Okay, uh, in this case it's barbed wire. For horses you definitely would want to use electrified ribbon or tape uh, for visibility. Basically this prevents animals from leaning on the top of the fence, uh, from getting their head out over the top and pressing it down. It's, it's not very strong uh, in this vertical orientation, so animals can press it down and crush the fence pretty easily. That's the purpose of having this top uh, barbed or hot wire on top. That's pretty much all I want to talk about for woven wire. Um, basically, important things are to keep that gauge that's in the spec and make sure it's not welded wire, make sure it is actually woven wire. These conductors combine plastic filaments with steel wires for an electrified conductor. Poly wire, this nine strand and six strand, are only used for rotational grazing to move groups through a pasture system uh, by setting up temporary fences, locking them in a certain area each day. Uh, poly rope, poly tape, and poly braid can all be used for permanent fences. They can just be mounted with regular insulators to wood posts uh, but primarily only in the horse industry. Horses need a visual barrier in addition to electricity uh, to keep them contained. Otherwise, they'll sometimes run into a fence or rub up against it if they don't see what it's made out of. Um, so uh, these range in price from about one to two cents a foot for the poly wire, and then up to seven to 10 cents foot per foot for the poly tape and the poly braid. And in general, uh, the more you pay, the better quality and longevity you'll, you'll get. One important thing to remember is that none of these will carry a shock as far as high tensile steel. So you're not going to get miles and miles of charged fence out of this. Uh, 
I think in general half a mile is about the upper limit for uh, effective containment. But again, really where this stuff shines is for rotational grazing systems. Uh, you can easily wind it up on a reel and deploy it day after day. It's not going to break. It's going to last a long time. This example is a single paddock that has a quarter mile of fencing on each side arranged in a big square. There are 25 line posts on each side and a single H brace at the end of each leg. Gates at each corner and no corner braces due to the gate locations. There's a 100 foot insulated wire to the fence charger and power source located in a barn nearby. It's going to be a three wire fence with a switchable middle wire. That's the design so far. The fence IR is going to help us figure out the rest of the design. You'll see as we go through the IR, most design aspects are covered, but add-ons like switches, extra grounding, and weak soils aren't. So include them in the description of work. Now for each IR, attachments are usually required and there's check boxes for those. In this case, we'll need a plan map. That can be as simple as the sketch I've just shown, or as complicated as a detailed two-scale drawing on uh, in CAD with GIS background photos. In addition, you'll need to attach the relevant specifications, and I have that checked here as well. Lastly, you need to explain the purpose of the fence. In this case, we're installing permanent perimeter fence for a grazing system. The next page gives us the wire number and spacing for different animal types. This pasture system is going to be for dairy cows and heifers, and it's a permanent fence. So we'll need this middle option down at the bottom now this middle one here, minimum of three strands, all electrified, spaced at 18, 30, and 42 inches off the ground. This chart includes uh, recommendations for non-electric wire as well. So just remember that this IR is for electric and non-electric designs. The next few charts are to organize your design decisions and provide a list of materials. First is a table that lists the fence lengths for each track and field. Next up is a table for your energizer and ground bed information. I'm using the rough guide of one joule per mile of fence and a standard ground bed of three six foot rods spaced, six, spaced 10 feet apart. Next we've got the fence wire information. This is basically pulled from the table up above. For wire specifications, these are pulled from the 382B specifications so shouldn't change much from project to project. Line post information is also pulled from the 382B specification, but there are fields to fill in for gate type, insulator types, and whether you'll need battens. Same for brace posts and brace rails. Those are pulled from the 382B spec, but here is where you specify what type of brace wire is required. The last table is a spot to suggest a temporary fence you can leave this blank if the producer is already an experienced grazer. If they're just starting out, this is a good setup that balances ease of use and durability. Fence has a 10 year lifespan. That's the program lifespan for government programs. The actual fence should last much longer than 10 years. The operation and maintenance guide is always worth reviewing and you want to make sure the producer knows they need to follow these instructions. Next up in the IR are the detail sheets. Out of the first four sheets, you're supposed to pick the one that best fits your project and discard the others. You can delete the sheets in Acrobat Standard if you have that, or just print the packet and discard the ones you don't need. There's one sheet for electric fences and then three options for non-electric high tensile wire. We'll be using the electric fence version and we're just copying info into it from the tables we just filled out in the IR. It's duplicate information, but it helps to have it on a drawing in your design packet. Skipping down past the non-electric sheets, there's a sheet covering end braces and another for line braces. Next is a sheet for brace spacing. Then there's a sheet for instructions for making a brace wire and then instructions for stapling and splicing wire. 
These last few sheets don't have any fillable fields. They're meant for reference only. That wraps up the Fence IR. Now we're nearing the end of the course and I want you to try out a couple example problems before we get to the course project. Here's a simple paddock example that I want you to estimate quantities for and develop an IR. It's basically a 200 foot by 200 foot square with the corner chopped off and I want you to fill in the blanks on the side here for brace, corner posts, cross members, line posts, feet of fence, and feet of wire. It's a four wire electrified high tensile fence. Fill out the fence IR as best you can, making assumptions and design decisions as needed. This plan sheet, a blank IR, and a solutions IR are included in the course materials linked in the description of this video. Next up, we have a problem that's a little more complicated. We're starting with an existing pasture shown with solid lines. The new fence is shown with dashed lines. We're splitting it down the middle and also fencing animals out of the stream. So just like with the simple example, I want you to come up with quantities for brace and corner posts, brace cross members, line posts, feet of wire and feet of fence. And in this case, I want you to decide what type of stream crossing to include across here and just write down your answer in the blank space and include any necessary posts and braces in your sketch. Then fill out an IR as best you can. The plan map and solutions are in the course materials packet. Now we're on to the final part of this course, the course project. It is similar to the examples that we've just done, except this is at a real site. For this project, a horse owner is planning to fix some rundown fence by replacing it with woven wire fence. There are two stream crossing on this, crossings on this site. One downstream on the left side of the sheet is a culvert crossing, and then the one upstream over to the right is an at-grade crossing over concrete slabs. The photo icons on this page show the direction of four photos that were taken at the site, so let's just look through them briefly to help you get your bearings. This one's looking diagonal upstream across the stream. This one's looking upstream along the fence line from the left-hand side of the plan map. This one's looking straight across the culvert crossing. And this one's looking upstream above the at-grade crossing. There's a very large culvert that animals use to cross under a road. This just shows the materials used at the at-grade crossing and shows a typical summertime flow level. Use this information when designing how to fence across the, the crossing. So just like in the example problems, I want you to estimate the materials for the fence and fill out an IR for the project. Send your plan sheet and completed IR in to me and that will count towards your basic level conservation approval authority for fence. For all students that have made it this far, thanks for watching, and feel free to leave any comments below or email me at the state office.